The following program deals with controversial subjects, and due to its explicit nature, parental guidance is strongly advised. The theories, opinions, and beliefs expressed are not the only possible interpretations. The viewer is invited to make a judgment based on all available information. Tonight on Sightings, we rip the cover off America's epidemic of evil. I did not kill my girlfriend. My master Satan did. From possessed killers to satanic rituals. Did you ever kill? Yes, I had to kill a number of people. Then our special ghost investigation uncovers a sinister poltergeist terrorizing a California family. Welcome to Sightings. I'm Tim White. Most people agree that evil exists in this world. For some it's war, famine, or violence. For some it's a spiritual darkness. And for others, evil is a very real presence, a physical entity of terrifying power. Tonight, Sightings investigates what many people believe is an epidemic of organized evil operating underground. What is evil? Is it merely a dictionary definition, morally wrong or bad? Or is it something more, a deeper, darker force that makes people perform cruel and inhuman acts? Does an evil force really exist that can attract and then control the actions of human beings? Or is evil nothing more than a convenient excuse for deviant and destructive behavior? These are questions without easy answers and are continually debated by those who study the human mind and the human spirit. Everywhere in the world we've seen cruelty and uh, things that are vicious and things that are anti-human and that, that somehow that that's, that's the, the kind of the opposite of, uh, of the affirmation of life. The great mass of human misery is caused not by some evil force but by the stupid beliefs and actions that we engage in. A human being has power in this world to do what he or she wants. And if what you want to do is evil, you can do terrible things. We have to decide to be good or evil. No one else makes that decision. We're exposed to evil every day. Robbery, kidnapping, even murder have become tragically commonplace on the evening news. We've become anesthetized to the evil around us and have even embraced it in mass media. Friday the 13th is one of the most successful movie series in history. The evil Freddy Krueger has even become a folk hero. But then there is evil that will never be trivialized in media. Hitler, architect of Nazism and the mastermind of the Holocaust. Stalin, butcher of 40 million. Cult leader Jim Jones, who led 900 into mass suicide. Jeffrey Dahmer and Charles Manson. What drives people like these to the depths of evil? Many believe that they are vehicles for the devil. Today, Satan is free to go and do within limits, whatever he pleases. I did not kill my girlfriend. My master Satan did. Satan, Lucifer, Beelzebub. Whatever this force is called, it's been the inspiration for madmen whose victims pay the ultimate price. At Harris County Jail in Houston, Texas, sightings investigated the claims of one murderer who maintains that the devil made him do it, the supreme evil spirit he calls Satan. I didn't choose to kill my girlfriend. It was done by the influence of the demon. I believe that Satan wanted her to die. April 20th, 1991, while Angela Singer, a known prostitute, was out working, David Trevillo, nicknamed Damien, was in this motel room conjuring up what he believed to be the devil. I started uttering an incantation to Lucifuge Rofakel. I felt him enter me. I went into the spirit world and brought it back out with me. I started speaking in tongues I didn't understand. When my girlfriend came back, she got cold chills as soon as she walked in the door. David Trevillo stabbed Angela Singer 39 times and insists that demonic supernatural forces were at work. But is that a defense anyone is willing to accept? Clinical psychologist Ralph Underwager believes there is nothing paranormal about Trevillo's heinous acts. 
No, I would never deny that Satan exists. What I would deny most vehemently is that he has any power whatsoever to control or to direct or to possess human beings. Don't blame me. The devil made me do it. And that is pure, plain, unadulterated balderdash. Yet law enforcement agencies nationwide, from the largest metropolitan areas to the smallest precincts, report that they are encountering what may be an epidemic of evil. For many of them, the concept of Satan is very real. It's like you or I would believe in God, they believe in, the, in Satan. And some officers don't believe it. Uh, it's just ghost stories to them. I myself, I've personally seen cases. It's not only a local problem for a small department such as mine, it's a national problem. David Trovillo may not be the boy next door, but is he the servant of a greater evil he calls Satan? Whatever the cause for his actions, he is now a convicted murderer, sentenced to 40 years to life. It's not the fault of illness, it's not the fault of Satan, it's the fault of the human heart. As horrible as Trovillo's crimes may be, there are people who believe there is another, even more sinister kind of evil groups of people who gather for the purpose of performing brutal, sadistic rituals in the name of the devil. Despite the testimonies of victims, many people still don't believe devil worship takes place. Instead of listening to the victims, they want proof of satanic sightings. What's your situation? Um, my father was high priest of a cult. My arms were tied above my head, and I was hung from a pole and swung out over a pit, and in the pit were bones and snakes. I was punished with a knife. What do you mean punished with a knife? I had to cut my own hand as a punishment. I have a scar on it. Syndicated radio talk show host Bob Larson is heard daily on over 250 stations. He reaches out to survivors who believe that they've been the victims of violent satanic rituals. Rituals that are so brutal and bizarre, they border on unbelievability. Let me tell you, I have been there and worked with for hours and hours with hundreds of victims who have been through this. They're not all liars. They're not all making it up. They're not all crazy. They're not all psychotic. Something's going on here. Husband and wife counseling team, Dr. Walter and Linda Young, are the leading pioneers in treating victims of ritual abuse. Linda and I work in this field together, and obviously we have to deal with what it's like day in and day out to work with people who've been traumatized to this extent. And I would have to say that when we're talking about issues of ritual abuse, where patients are talking about murder, or they're talking about a sacrifice or their own rapes and things of this sort, uh, it really takes its toll because of the sense of the unbelievability of how they survived it. I've heard of babies being killed, people delivering babies um, prematurely, or um, full-term babies that have been sacrificed. and. Um, satanic rituals where people are married to Satan and impregnated by someone or a group of people. Um, again, no one wants to hear that. It's, it's too horrific for the population. Barbara Jackson is a scientist with a PhD in biochemistry and a former instructor at Harvard Medical School. She claims to be a survivor of satanic ritual abuse. For Barbara, memories of childhood torture didn't surface until she was an adult. Her stories of abuse follow a pattern exactly like those of other survivors Barbara has never met. Coming forward has taken immense personal courage. On a night when there was going to be a ritual, what would happen? People would start arriving, and they would have robes. And I would just be brought into the basement, and the basement is divided into two halves. One half is open. That's often where the table that the child or the animal would be put on to be hurt. I remember one time being put on this table that they were using, and they would hurt me with a metal crucifix. What is evil for you? Evil feels to me like a force. Barbara, many people who might be very s sympathetic with you would simply not believe you. How could anything this horrendous occur? We already know that things this horrendous have occurred routinely throughout the world. Claims of being raped by crucifixes or being crucified oneself are hogwash. Uh, the best bet for any reasonable person is to see this as a perfervid 
fantasy of a twisted imagination. As you might imagine, many of the people I interviewed were extremely reluctant to come forward. And those victims remain afraid of retaliation by their abusers and ridicule by a skeptical public. But despite their fears, they have spoken out in the hope that they may help others avoid the same fate. Coming up, the victims of satanic rituals reveal their horrifying tales when our special investigation continues. Did you ever kill? Yes, I had to kill a number of people. As we hear these horrifying stories of ritualistic abuse, it's impossible not to wonder how such inhuman behavior could go undetected. The stories that survivors tell are so horrible, they seem almost unbelievable. And, in fact, there are experts who question whether the evil of satanic cults is fact or fantasy. In truth, real physical evidence is lacking. But how, or why, would anyone invent such disturbing stories? The current furor over satanic cults is foolish for a very simple reason. There is no corroborating evidence of any sort that has ever been found. Connie Valentine is a survivor who holds a master's degree in rehabilitative counseling. She works with other survivors who remember the same types of ritual abuse Connie believes she herself has endured. Why are you telling this story? It needs to be stopped. Somebody needs to say it. I figure the worst they can do is kill me. They've certainly tortured me an awful lot and dying doesn't frighten me anymore. Did you ever kill? Yes, I had to kill a number of people when I was young. How did you do that? I had to put knives in their stomach. Many times they would put their hand around my hand and they would put the knife in and let me know that this was my fault. Was someone or something always killed? Almost always. What is evil to you? I always used to think that Satan was a figment of somebody's imagination. The more survivors I talk to, the more people are reporting they witnessed that entity in their memory. An evil entity, an evil force. Survivors believe they've experienced that force firsthand. But while there is a frightening similarity to stories from people who have never met, an argument can be made for the persuasive power of suggestion. Is satanic ritual abuse real? Or is it false memory produced by therapists? To have recovered repressed memories, to have flashbacks to events that they never knew about before and had no memories of before, that I say yes, indubitably, is a false memory and that those events never occurred. I think we're training more and more therapists to know how to treat these people. And I think more and more people really are willing to take that challenge to go back in time and feel the pain. Do you feel your life was ruined by this? No, I feel my life path was permanently altered. But it's possible to live through it, transcend it, live with the after effects, and interact very richly with life, to reconnect with people, with spirituality, with all the things that have meaning, because they can't take that away. Joining me now is Gretchen Passantino, who has been researching the occult and satanic ritual abuse for more than 20 years. An author and lecturer, Ms. Passantino heads an educational organization whose purpose is to debunk the notion that Satanism is an organized force. Gretchen, welcome to Sightings. Thank you very much, Tim. As you know, I had an opportunity to speak with people who believed themselves to be survivors of ritual abuse. Their stories were compelling. They certainly believed what they had been through. But you're not convinced. Why? Well, Tim, I'm very glad that you brought out that these adult survivors believe what they're saying. But I believe that a much more reasonable uh, explanation that fits the evidence better is that they have been given the wrong tools for knowing the truth and knowing the past through directive contaminated therapy that tells them that images in their minds are actually memories that, of things that have actually happened to them. So you think it's all power of suggestion then on behalf of the therapists who are trying to help them? I think it's more complex than simply power of suggestion. They come up with things that they are told are repressed memories and yet they actually are not. 
what would be convincing evidence? Well, I think you would have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. I'm not saying that there are not evil people who sometimes do very evil atrocities to other people, but what I'm saying is unsubstantiated, directive, contaminated therapeutic testimony is not the best way to find reality. What if they're right, Gretchen, and you're wrong? If the sensationalism of the satanic ritual abuse scare is true, then logic doesn't matter, evidence doesn't matter, investigation doesn't matter, the psychotherapists have become the priests, the new religion. I'm not willing to accept that. I don't think it's reasonable. Gretchen, thank you very much. Thank you. And we will be back with more sightings in just a moment. Coming up next, our special ghost investigation uncovers a sinister poltergeist terrorizing a California family. I'm not sure I would want to stay here. In the episode of Sightings, we introduced you to the Mock family, who had contacted us about a ghost haunting their home in Garden Grove, California. We asked professional ghost hunter Lloyd Auerbach to conduct an investigation for us. And tonight, we follow Lloyd into the Mock home to watch the process step by step. In this quiet, comfortable suburb of Los Angeles, Anita Mock, her daughter, and her cousin have all reported encounters with two distinct entities in their home. One, a ghostly apparition dressed in white with beady, glowing eyes. The other, a mischievous poltergeist in the back bedroom. My little girl's hysterical, and I can't do anything. I feel so weak, so helpless, and I don't know what to do. After my initial visit, Lloyd Auerbach brought his team into the mock home. While he took magnetic field readings, therapist Karen Husing tested the family. We literally have things happening that don't always mesh together. Normally, when you see an apparition in a case, you don't normally also have physical object movements. So this is kind of a mixed bag case that we'll have to take a little closer look at through process of interviewing and checking out the house itself. Where was it when you, the, you heard the sound? Was it flipped over it like that? It flipped like this. Okay, it so it really wasn't easy to get at anyway. No, uh -huh. I'm getting an anomaly, and we, we are correlating these anomalies to the spots that people are sensing or seeing apparitional or haunting phenomena, hearing things. What could the family be experiencing? We found that the house did have a history of domestic violence and untimely death prior to the time the box moved in. Before turning their case over to sightings, Anita had asked a priest to bless the home, but the entity remained. He blessed the house, he went around here really quick, and when he was done, all he told me was um, that I need to go back to church. In addition to Auerbach's team, we asked psychic Sylvia Brown to record her impressions in the house. Sylvia had strong, unsettling feelings. Yeah, see, this room also has, Anita, some activity. When I first came into the house, I felt this tremendous amount of violence, physical violence, glass cracking, noise, and there's a murder, a killing, blood, uh, somebody's face slashed. We have a case here of layer upon layer of poltergeist, haunting, um, I'm not sure I would want to stay here. But there are people living here, and they don't want to be forced out. In addition to the poltergeist activity, they're still plagued by encounters with the apparition in what? It was wearing white, and it was peeking around the door, and it had, like, its hands on the door. She grabbed my daughter because she was afraid to look up at her. Right. She was afraid, because it, it looked solid. She was afraid it was going to come out and get her. And this is the very spot where uh, Heather said she saw the ghost. So normally, th what this house is reading is one milligauss, normally. But this is going up uh, as high as two and a half milligauss and three, and that's, you know, double or almost triple what you're experiencing in the rest of the house. Lloyd's magnetometer measures the level of electromagnetic energy in milligauss. Do the unusually high magnetometer readings he's getting here explain why apparitions, poltergeists, slamming doors, and spinning clocks have all been reported in the house? Or does an answer lie in the minds of the family? In a state of deep relaxation, Heather Wyeda recalls the apparition under hypnosis. This entity that you have seen in the house, we'd like to invite him to join you so that we can communicate. I think he's here. Is there something that he wishes to communicate? That he's not trying to hurt me or my family. Does he know how he died? He said he doesn't like to talk about it. Mm-hmm. Is there anything else that he did that 
he could tell us about. He said he's sorry for hurting Amanda when he tried to pick her up. We just had a hypnosis session. I thought to come in here and check the reading, which we were getting. And most of the house reads between 1 and 1.5 milligauss, which is what we're now reading here in this spot. I mean, before the hypnosis session, I was reading between 2 and 2.5. Uh, it may be a coincidence, but actually it's very interesting to me that we have resolved the situation. The ghost is supposedly going away, and there's no longer a high reading. Since our first report on the Garden Grove haunting, another viewer called the sightings hotline with an important new lead. He told us that in 1987, his mother, Winnie Rawls, died traumatically in this house. When I walked in here by myself before we began this filming, and I was able to talk out loud to her, I felt a distinct presence. I don't feel that anymore. It's different now. Something is different. I think that she might be free. I think that she needed to be told by me and my great fear of coming to do this at all uh, was that my mother somehow was trapped and, and couldn't get away and, and was unhappy. And I thought, well, if I come and, and see and can talk to her privately, which I was able to do, uh, maybe she would let go. Bill Rawls believed that the spirit of his mother was looking for a way out of this house. But the mocks believe they're being pursued by a male entity. Could these be the two distinct entities felt in the house? Definitely there is a female spirit in, what should I say, residence here. Yes, now there might be a man that might be sighted, but it's definitely a female personality. I feel great for calling you guys because I didn't know who to call. I was really scared. I had no idea what was going on and it just feels like home again. If you've experienced what you believe to be a ghost, or if you've had any type of paranormal encounter, our sightings investigative team wants to know about it. To report your sighting, call 1-900-740-SIGHT. Each call 75 cents a minute, average call lasts two minutes, and you must be 18 years or older. On the next sightings, many thought the English crop circles were a hoax, but startling new evidence may prove there's more here than meets the eye. This intelligence is almost certainly not human. On the next sightings. Join us next time for new investigations into the unexplained. For sightings, I'm Tim White. Tomorrow on a special homicide edition of Cops, follow an actual investigation from beginning to end and be there when detectives close in on the suspected killer. Then, witness the drama of real hostage rescues on an all-new Code 3. Now, stay tuned for Likely Suspects, next.